This is Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast where we bring Jesus into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Hey guys, welcome to Sports Spectrum. I am Jason Romano. My email address is jason at sportspectrum.com. Jason at sportspectrum.com. Any guest ideas, any thoughts on today's show? The incredible story of Matthew Mayer. Anything you want to add about Sports Spectrum, you can reach me directly at my email address, jason at sportspectrum.com. We are presented today by Water Mission, a nonprofit Christian engineering ministry that fights the global water crisis with safe water, sanitation, and hygiene solutions in developing countries and disaster areas. They've served more than 5 million people in 56 countries and a great opportunity for you to partner with them right now. Pray with them and donate to Water Mission. Fighting the global water crisis, you can check them out at watermission.org, watermission.org. We're also presented today by Compassion International, releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. Check them out at Compassion.com slash team up, and you can team up right now with pro athletes and Compassion for children in poverty. This is critical right now with COVID-19, potentially 70,000 children left without a sponsorship, and they need your help. Check them out at Compassion.com slash team up and help release a child from poverty today. Today is one of those amazing stories that we talk about pretty often here on Sports Spectrum, but this one, this is one that you're going to shake your head at when you hear it, and it's one where you look to God and say, man, he can really turn a mess into a message, a test, some of the deepest, darkest tests that a person could ever go through into a testimony, and he did that with our guest today, Matthew Mayer. Matthew is a former pro soccer player who's now a pastor. He's the teaching pastor at Coastal Christian Church in Ocean City, New Jersey. He also goes around and speaks a lot to different areas like high schools and colleges, municipal alliances, certainly churches. I'm not going to give it all away here. Just trust me on this. Listen to this interview. And if you're not encouraged and inspired by Matthew Mayer when we're done, man, you got to check your pulse. This is one powerful story. Take a listen to Matthew Mayer joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. Matthew Mayer, welcome to Sports Spectrum, buddy. What's up, Jason? Thank you for the opportunity to all those listening. God bless you. Thank you, buddy. So good that you're here. Your story is a really powerful one, one that I really didn't know a ton about until I did the research for this interview. And uh, as I'm researching more and more, I knew your story was, was, was one I wanted to share, but I, I didn't realize how dark and deep it got. Uh, and I'm no, I know that you're using your story now to share with others. So before we get to that part of it, cause this will, sure. this will be a, a progression, I think in this conversation, let's learn about, I'll just take a date and I'll say, let's learn about Matthew Mayher prior to March 7th, 2009. And I'll let you you take it from there. You grew up in a New Jersey in a Christian home, right? Correct. Name's Matthew Mayer, born and raised in South Jersey. I'm one of four boys. So I was the the little runt of the litter. My father was in law enforcement my entire youth. That's all I knew growing up. My father as a police officer, eventually chief of police of a precinct in South Jersey and a current under sheriff of Cape May County. So he's still in law enforcement to speak. My mother was a stay-at-home mom, right, raising her children, watched them exemplify faith, watched them live it. Where it really impacted me was seeing how they didn't necessarily force faith principles on us, but they, they lived it so that we could see it, leaving the obvious decisions up to their four boys. But watching my mother and father navigate just different circumstances of life is really what grounded me in my faith. I excelled rapidly academically and athletically because of being the youngest, following in the footsteps of my older brothers. We played every type of sport, but soccer became my main sport. I was very gifted. I think the talent is what brought me into certain circles and certain, you know, accolades and rewards eventually in high school was a standout soccer player and basketball. I often throw that out there because I love basketball as a point Mm -hmm. guard for Middle Township High School. We won a state championship. So 
soccer was what got me a full scholarship to Temple University. Again, there was plenty of other schools to choose from. I fell in love with the Philadelphia city feel and the campus, loved the coach there. Wound up going there for four years, was part of extracurricular activities that had to do with faith, fellowship of Christian athletes, athletes in action. But I guess I should mention that in those seasons, faith was more something that I was associated with when it was convenient or was more about an intellectual knowledge because I was raised in it. So I knew the gospel. I knew the Bible. So if you asked me a question about being an athlete on a secular college campus, I would have been like, oh, I'm a Christian. But that would have been the extent of my faith. I was eventually drafted as a first round draft pick in my senior year. So I graduated from the Fox School of Business, got the degree that was very important for for me at the time. And I eventually entered into the USL First Division with the Carolina Railhawks and then the MISL with the New Jersey Ironmen and the Philadelphia Kicks. So that's kind of like the the skinny version of a lot more details uh, about who I was pre-March 7, 2009. So take us through your progression of faith. And it sounds like you would have said you were a Christian. You you had the knowledge, certainly, but you also had soccer. And I know for me, you know, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, but for many years, even after I became a Christian and said, you know, yes to God, yes to Jesus, I still struggled with the world and sort of even my identity being found in what I did, certainly as a as a producer at ESPN. So right. where was that for you during, again, pre-March 7, 2009, with in terms of your faith and the wrestling between faith and kind of pursuing and, and passionate, uh, or pursuing your passion, I should say, for soccer? Yeah, you know what? It really became um, uh, a divided stance after 18 years of age. Obviously, that particular year would have been the year I became a college student. And left to my own devices, making my own decisions, faith became something that was compartmentalized, right? My mom would send me a devotional or a book. I'd read it. We would dialogue about faith and what the Lord was doing and how I'm speaking at FCA and I'm praying with my teammates. But mind you, on Friday and Saturday, if we have a game on a Sunday, I was as worldly as it came. I was out and about. I was partying and I thought I could have my foot in the world while still maintaining a conviction of having my feet in the word. And that's a divided stance. And that divided stance literally from 18 to 24 years of age was the narrative of my life. So even though soccer was the sport, it was the platform. I remember as a pro getting called for interviews just like this because I was a Christian in a professional sport. And they wanted to know how does a Christian navigate the temptations of the world and you know what comes with this type of lifestyle. And I would have said all the right answers, right? You would have left the interview, Jason, going, wow, that that young man's got a good head on his shoulders. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, it was total hypocrisy. Um, At the end of the interview, we would have prayed. And then if there was a weekend coming up, I would have been out in a bar drinking, um, just living that life with with no accountability, really. And here's the sad reality. Most people have looked at the life that I was living and and went, I want that life, right? Because he's successful. He's young. You know, he's got the world at the palm of his hands. And that was the beginning of pride. And the Bible says pride comes before uh, a destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So it was a slow fade. You know, sin will take you further than you ever want to stray. Sin will keep you longer than you ever want to stay. And sin will cost you more than you ever want to pay. But you don't see it when you're in it. And, and that's the scary part of losing sight of a fixed position known as our faith in Jesus. Mm. So take us to March 1st, two thousand. Nine. And it's interesting. People were like, well, you've been talking about March 7th, 2009, right. but there's actually a really poignant moment that takes place six days earlier on that date, March 7th. That's such a powerful date for, uh, you know, changes your life forever. A few days before that, though, that's a pretty powerful day as well. Take us to what happened March 1st and maybe even just the events that lead up to that day in terms of your pro soccer career. So I had just been uh, traded to the Philadelphia organization, the Philadelphia Kicks. My older brother, Anthony, was actually on that team. He's a 10-year professional soccer player, a veteran. So coming back to the city of my alma mater, Temple University, I was excited to be with Anthony, play in the city that I went to college. But again, this would be the beginning of the end because now I'm back in a setting that I was familiar with. My four years in college, the bars and the people and, and all that came with that lifestyle. 
And I signed with the Philadelphia Kicks, played for those first few months, January, February, and then March 1st is the date that you just mentioned. It was in that game on a Sunday in the Philadelphia Spectrum where I tore my ACL and my meniscus. So in hindsight, of course, you can make so many lessons out of what God was trying to accomplish. He was trying to get my attention then, I believe. I believe that was the moment where I had a decision to make. Of course, this could be a career-ending injury for many athletes. You're at this high level and this knee injury can take you not only out of the game permanently, but it's a psychological injury after the surgery and all that goes with it. It's a very um, mentally anguished injury. So when it happened, the MRI confirmed that I had torn my ACL, my meniscus. They scheduled the surgery the following week for March 12th. So this week in question would have been a very pivotal time to turn back to the Lord, right? Trust him regardless of the circumstances. At least that's what faith in the word of God tells us to do. Trust God regardless and he'll make things good out of it. Romans 8, 28. But that's not what I did. I didn't trust the word. I trusted the ways of the world. So instead of leaning back on my faith, letting God have my undivided attention, I chose to go out, Jason, on March 6th. It was actually a Friday night. Mm -hmm. um, the Philadelphia Kicks were traveling on March 7th to Baltimore. I wouldn't be participating in that game, obviously. So was essentially on the injured reserve list. Decided to go out in the city of Philadelphia on March 6th, late at night, picked up a friend, went for some dinner. There was no plans. And I guess a lot of the cliche sayings that you may hear aren't so cliche when you actually think them through and live them out. And the saying is when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And I had no plan that Friday night, just was going out. Many of the articles that preface where I was at mentally that week before March 7th, this date, which we're about to tell everybody what happened, um, they said, Mayor was depressed because of the injury. And I really wasn't depressed. I wasn't discouraged. It was more entitlement. Again, it was more like, okay, this happened to me. I don't know if I'm ever going to play again. I'm going to go do me. And again, the onus of responsibility of pride was on me. Like, I'm going to go live my way. I'm going to do what I want because I'm going through it. And that was my attitude that night. So Went out to some bars, had some drinks. Mind you, I'm 24 years of age, so I'm legally allowed to be in these establishments. Yeah. Unfortunately, after a night of drinking and, and talking over with some friends about my current situation, it was just like it got the best of me. Um, without getting into too many details, I had a conversation with a bartender who knew my older brother. He knew me. We were kind of talking about soccer and knee injuries, and that was like our you know commonality, and I started taking shots, just several shots in a row. And from that point forward, Jason, it was, I lost my inhibition to make sound decisions, got into my vehicle that particular evening. Now you're entering into after midnight hours, it touches um, on the date of March 7th. That's why that date is mentioned by you. Yeah. I often say before I tell people what happened, I ever made it to my destination. And the night of March 7, 2009, for me personally, has not yet ended. And when I say that, I mean, there's still consequences and there's still ramifications that echo into my day to day, all this time later, because of a decision that I made on March 7, 2009. Hmm. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back here on Sports Spectrum with Matthew Maher. Hey guys, I want to tell you about our sponsors today, Water Mission, working to stop the global spread of COVID-19 right now. They're doing important work, providing urgently needed safe water, sanitation, and hygiene solutions to refugee settlements and other vulnerable communities. The work that they do right now, I can't stress how important it is. Think about this. 4.4 billion people lack access to adequate sanitation. 2.1 billion people lack access to safe water. Those are billions. That's a lot of people. And we take that for granted every day. When we wake up, we go brush our teeth, we go grab a, a drink of water, we go to the bathroom, and we don't even realize how blessed we are to have that when so many people, billions of people around the world lack access to those basic essentials. Well, that's where Water Mission comes in fighting the global water crisis in a great way right now for you to partner with them, to donate, to pray with them, and become a part of all that Water Mission is doing. Check out their website, watermission.org, to learn more. Watermission.org. We're also presented today by Compassion International, and I mentioned COVID-19. It's still out there. It's still a thing, and it's left nearly 70,000 children 
without a sponsorship through compassion. See, compassion partners people with these children to release them from poverty. It's a great program that they do. And a lot of these sponsorships come from places like concerts and other large events, all that have been tabled because of COVID-19. So 70,000 children potentially without a sponsor, and that's the capacity of an average NFL stadium. So as the world is in the grips of COVID-19, it's led to more sickness, parents aren't working, food is scarce. And right now, the frontline church partners are courageously delivering essential items to desperate children and families, often door to door. So what Compassion has done is they're teaming up right now with some of our pro-athlete friends to respond to this challenge. And with your help, we're hoping to fill the stadium with urgent support for a stadium's worth of children in crisis. Here's how you can help. You can donate by going to the website, Compassion.com slash team up. Compassion.com slash team up. You can donate and help these children through the next critical 12 months. Every donation helps fill a seat toward a year of needed funding. Compassion.com slash team up and release a child from poverty today. And we're back now on Sports Spectrum with Matthew Maher. Let me ask you about that specific day, Matt. And it was March 7th, 2009, March 6th into March 7th. Correct. And here we are. Uh, that day changes your life forever. So why don't you just share what took place and what happened? Yeah, so foolishly and recklessly, I made the decision to get behind the wheel of my vehicle, believing that I could make it to my next destination, which just so happened to be Atlantic City with a friend. So we got into my vehicle, we left Philadelphia, got on the Atlantic City Expressway, and I began to speed. Wasn't driving erratically or recklessly at this particular point other than speeding up. Another vehicle was merging, and because of the speed that I was going at, I ended up rear-ending this vehicle. My front right struck his back left. We spun out of control. My vehicle actually rail slid the guardrail on the Atlantic City Expressway after the accident reconstruction revealed. Like my vehicle should have flipped over and went into the, the brush in the wooded area. The other person's vehicle flipped over and landed on the right side of a four-lane highway. So I guess I'll just take you to that moment. I am um, I'm shooken up greatly. My passenger is with me. OnStar clicks on in my vehicle. They're telling me to stay put. The emergency response is on the way. I remember exiting my vehicle, tending to my friend. He was very shooken up. I put him on the guardrail. We sat there for a moment. Now I'm noticing people pulling over in the middle of the highway, obviously, jumping out of their cars and coming over to aid and assist. Now, this is all like in snapshots in my memory, but I'll never forget what I saw next. I looked across the street. I saw the vehicle that I had struck on its side, but I saw four individuals, four individuals standing outside of that vehicle, just like me and my friend were standing outside of my vehicle. So I reasoned in that very moment that that was the driver and the three passengers, perhaps, that were in that car. And they're good. They made it out. We're, we're good. We made it out. And I remember just sitting there. The police were there within moments. They detained me. They took me into custody. I failed multiple field sobriety tests. And then they sat me down in a jail cell, Jason. I remember just sitting there just thinking through the consequences. That early. I'm under the influence, but I'm snapped out of this you know, intoxication. They say that just happens. The adrenaline is kicking in. And I'm thinking about what I did. I'm good. My passenger with me, he was fine that night. I assumed the other individuals involved were fine. I'm going to get a DUI. I knew that much. I'm going to lose my license. I'm on the injured reserve list right now. What's the team going to do with my contract? Because you're not mm -hmm. to have any interaction with breaking the law. This certainly violated that contract. I'm thinking about my father, Jason, who's a law enforcement official at the time, what he's going to think of his youngest son. He raised me better than this. And all these thoughts are going through my mind. And as I'm listening to the conversation outside of the jail cell, I overhear the dispatch. Now, I can't see them. But I could hear the dispatch center, and they're reporting on the incident. And I'll never forget what I heard. And these are the exact words that are seared into my soul. The dispatch said, accident on the Atlantic City Expressway is curr currently being cleaned up. So I remember kind of like perking up and listening. They said, the driver in the Escalade is in custody, and that was me. Mm -hmm. Then his next words were, the driver in the town and country is deceased. Mm -hmm. And I remember going into denial about what I just heard. I went into shock. I refuse to believe that what that dispatch person just said was true. And I instantly shut down. I remember just kind of going into this whirlwind of emotion. The, the morning came. They took me out of my jail cell. They sat me in an interrogation room. I spoke first. I walked in devastated. And I said, may I ask a question? They said, yes. I said, 
did the driver die? And they said, Matthew, brace yourself. And I just lost it, Jason. I just began to weep uncontrollably. The state police officers came over and actually consoled me. They gave me tissues. They waited for me to gain my composure. And then they read me my uh, Miranda rights. You have the right to remain silent. And at that particular point, I remember thinking, I have nothing to hide. I'm not going to wait for legal representation. I'm going to just tell them what they want to know. And I told them everything. Every question they asked, I was forthright as much as I possibly could remember. And I guess this particular story is pretty, pretty remarkable in light of um, my spiritual formation. And I guess I'll get to the point. In the midst of all the interrogation and and the questions, a secretary came to the door and she said, excuse me. And they all stopped and she announced a guest. She said, his father's here. And then she formally introduced him, Chief John Mayer. And at that moment, every law enforcement official in that room literally stopped and said to me, are you kidding me? Your father's a cop? Your father's a chief? How come you didn't tell us that? And I I remember saying to them, what difference would it have made? My father walked into the room. He gave acknowledgement to every law enforcement official in that room. He didn't say a word, though. He looked them all in their eyes. He acknowledged them. And then he walked slowly down this long table where his son was seated. And Jason, he reached down and kissed me on my forehead. And he said, son, we're going to get through this. And I'll never forget that extension of love and grace that I did not deserve. I sat there in my absolute worst, and my earthly father gave me his absolute best. That was like the beginning of seeing how God loves us in spite of us. So all that I was raised in, my faith, the foundation, the gospel, that Christ died for us when we were in our sin, so it's not about us. That was like the beginning of God showing me that there's mercy and it's not based on any of my merit. So obviously I was um, walked through the legal system. I was charged with first degree aggravated manslaughter. That's the highest degree possible. Um, not typical for that particular crime, just to give our listeners context. Usually it's vehicular manslaughter, vehicular homicide. And I don't say that as a complaint against the system, but I share that to say I was looking at 10 to 30 years. And that is just something that somebody in my upbringing never would have imagined having that much time over my head, let alone enter into a world that I was only exposed to by movies or TV shows. Mm -hmm. So 10 months of that, having this weight of guilt and shame over me, having uh, legal consequences that were uncertain at this point. I was sentenced on January 7, 2010, right? So um, that time period, 10 months, in hindsight, seeing how the Lord was setting the stage for what none of us saw would happen on my sentencing day. Like nobody saw this coming on January 7, 2010. And I think this is the ultimate catalyst. I'm not sure if you saw it, Uh, But this is what makes me tick. This is what drives my passion for communicating God's grace. Mm. There's a lot there, obviously, to unpack. I really want to focus for a second on the time between March of 09 and January of 10 when you were sentenced. And you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but can I take me through? That's a long time. You know, it's not like you get you wake a couple weeks and you go in and certainly those weeks are hard, but that's you know, months and months and months, almost a year, really. Yeah. What, yep. what are you going through during that time? What's the emotions? What's the cycle of thoughts? What's your connection to God? What is that like for you in those months of really waiting and wondering what's going to what's gonna take place? It's a great question. Not many people really tap into those 10 months because they usually highlight the incident, March 7th, and then we jump to January 7th, the sentencing, and then thereafter. So those 10 months, I mean, I'm in a whirlwind. I'm waking up thinking this is a bad dream. Can't shake it. Uh, news reporters knocking on my door. Everywhere I went, I felt like there were eyes of shame and condemnation. And there probably were. There probably weren't. It was still this guilt that was weighing on me. But I remember falling back on this foundation of faith my mother and father raised me and my three older brothers in, right? Train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're older, they will not depart from it. That's Proverbs 22. And this foundation of faith, this rock beneath me, became the I guess launch pad. And I'll never forget, it was Psalms 4610 that literally stabilized my soul, right? So the soul, the psyche, the emotions, my decisions, they're all over the place because of the uncertainty of my future. But it was Psalm 4610 after reading it in a devotional, and it was God's voice saying, be still and know that I am God, right? Those two words, be still, when you look them up in Hebrew, it's like, let go and let God. Literally, that's the cliche that Most people go, it's just a cliche until you actually surrender and go limp 
and stop trying to put your hand where God's hand is. And it was in the those 10 months where those two words began to not only stabilize me, but then I began to use those two words to minister to my mom and dad. Mind you, I'm their youngest boy. They didn't sign up for this. They didn't think that this would ever happen. And those two words began to minister to them. I began to write them on my parents' cell phones as little text messages or posting notes and on the refrigerator. And I didn't know that those two words were helping them stay grounded in the midst of all of this uncertainty. So at the end of the summer, I maintained my role as a camp director uh, at a soccer camp that me and my older brother, Anthony, founded, Mayor Brother Soccer. This would have been like the third year that I was a part of it. And Anthony put out an email to the parents saying, hey, in light of Matthew's incident, you all read about it. We want to ask you how you feel about him joining us again this summer and coaching your kids. And there was a unanimous reply from all of the parents saying, we want Matt working with our kids. So that was huge that I feel mm-hmm. I still felt accepted, um, though it was an awkward uh, time, the summer months of those camps. Here's what happened. I would speak at the camps about you know my, my fate, my future, and I would use my faith in those moments. And it got back to my high school and my old Bible club proctor, who was a teacher there. So he decided to see if he can get it cleared for me to come speak at the high school come September. He called my mom and he actually said to her, how would Matthew like to come speak at the Bible club? And my mom was actually appalled, right? She was very defensive. She's a, you know, a mother bear watching over her cubs. And she took this man's words. They were friends, like as an offense, like, are you serious? You understand what we're going through? Like, we're still bleeding and you want Matt to come talk to kids about it. But I remember overhearing that conversation, Jason. And I said, mom, hold up a second. Let me go pray about it. I went upstairs in my bedroom. I said, Lord, if this is of you, if this is from you, give me such a sense of peace about it. Cause there's a lot of anxiety about putting myself out there that early. And I felt such peace. The Bible says it's peace that this world can't supply. Yeah. And I said, mom, I'm going to do it. And I spoke in front of 300 high school students in September. That actually caused the kids to go home and tell their parents, you won't believe who spoke to us. It was very impactful. So much so that the South Jersey Traffic Safety Alliance got involved and said, we want to take him into the schools in October, November, and December as much as we can before his sentencing day. And my lawyer advised against it, obviously. Um, this is very sensitive material that he's speaking on, but I still felt compelled based on accountability that these kids need to see somebody own their mistake. You often see pro soccer players, pro athletes get in trouble and then you don't hear a peep from them ever again. And you go, what happened? I wanted to be the opposite. I wanted to be the face that owned my calamity and my consequences and show these kids that even though you make mistakes, you don't run from them, you don't hide from them, you don't justify them, you own them. So I spoke at 35 different high schools, colleges, municipal alliance events, which is like, Again, in hindsight, you see that God was showing me that he's able to bring beauty out of ashes. And when you give him those circumstances, that's when he's able to make beauty. So that was all pre-sentencing. Like apparently the judge said this was unprecedented that somebody would go out on the circuit, not court mandated, right? This wasn't for any other reason than it was the right thing to do. And the, the judge, he viewed that extremely favorably. Like he never saw anything like it because of the remorse that was kind of oozing out of, of the platform at that particular time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's interesting to think, you know, I have heard a lot of stories, not a lot, but enough stories like yours of others who have gone through it and then they come out of it and share their Correct. story. They don't share it when they're going through it. You know, as we're going, as God would say, and a lot of people don't do that. And so that was, that's amazing for me to hear that you were able to still do it as you're, you're going and that as you're going takes you to your sentencing day, uh, in January of 2010. And I know you, you know, we were talking before we started recording, that's a big day in your journey as well, even though it might be looked at from the outside world as the worst day, because that's the day you find out you're going to jail and how long you'll spend time in prison but that's a powerful day for you. So take us to the moments that that you know sentencing day is happening. What takes place, not only what the sentencing was, but what really begins to take place inside of you. Right. So my victim's name is Hort Cap. He was a 55-year-old man, father, six kids, brother, and obviously somebody else's son. So that's the context. I'm responsible for making a decision that ended his life. The weight of knowing that entering into a sentencing day. So it wasn't just 
you know, due process where the judge would sentence me, it was more about seeing my victim's family for the first time face to face and having mm-hmm. the opportunity to express my remorse and apologize. I mean, that's all that drove me in those 10 months. Another part of those 10 months was just visualizing what is sentencing is going to look like. Like, not that the judge um, wasn't going to give me time in prison. Like, I didn't, I would have, I would deal with that when that happened. My heart wanted to express my apology to this, to this family that I didn't know. And I'll take you through, woke up, put a suit on. My father drove me. And obviously I'd, I'd end the day wearing a jumpsuit. So just to give you, I walk into a courtroom wearing a, an actual three-piece suit. I'm leaving wearing a jumpsuit, but in between arriving and leaving, this is what happens. My side, my lawyer, and obviously character um, references get to speak on my behalf. There were people that said, you know, who I was and the judge obviously heard all of those in letter form previous to the sentencing day. Um, then the victim's family gets to speak and his daughter stood up and she, she spoke eloquently and beautifully. She explained who her father was. So if you had any doubt on who her dad was, you knew who he was. She painted a beautiful picture. She said some kind words about even me. She said, we've heard nothing but good things about Mr. Mayor over here. And obviously they, they were brought into the process of me speaking out and they were okay with it. They in fact said it was a way for me to honor their dad as early as I possibly could. So there was no like pushback from them. We knew all that going in. So for her to say that, I remember kind of like being at ease, giving her my undivided attention, hearing what she said about her dad. It was beautiful. People are crying. And then her brother gets up, Mr. Hortcap's son. His name's Noon. And Noon began to throw off that entire vibe. He began yelling at the top of his lungs. He began to take every single person in that courtroom through the journey of how he heard about his father dying. It was a phone call from the police. And he actually took us through that phone call. He's like, I got a phone call. And he's yelling. He literally is yelling at the top of his lungs. And he says, and they told me my daddy died. And then he literally took us through what that meant to him, how it destroyed his world. And then he turned to me and he pointed at me and he said, you destroyed my world. And I remember crumbling on the inside, Jason. I remember actually weeping, but also praying and crying out to God and saying, Lord, don't let it end like this. And there's a video that supplements this. You can actually watch it on my website. And, and noon stops, there's this composure that comes over him and his very next words are, but I forgive you, my brother. He comes walking over, the bailiff tells me I can get up. I stand up and me and noon hug right there in the courtroom. We embrace and Jason, it is no exaggeration for me to say all of that guilt and all of that weight and all of that shame, it literally evaporated. It literally left. I can't even explain it. I can't verbalize it other than to say January 7th, 2010 for me, though I was physically incarcerated for the next 55 months, I was spiritually liberated. And like the Apostle Paul, I refused to look backwards except to learn a valuable spiritual lesson about God's faithfulness. So I went to jail, a man on fire, forgiven by God. And, and I see the symbolism and the parallel is remarkable. Think about what Romans 5, 8 says. It says, God demonstrates his own love toward us. God has his his own type of love in that while we're sinning, we're sinners, Christ died for us. The son died for us. Now picture Mr. Hortcap's son interrupting and intercepting the very reason that I'm in this position, the place of judgment. I'm there to receive judgment from a judge. And a son decided to interrupt that process and give me what I did not deserve in forgiveness. And I say that actually happened on the horizontal horizontal, and it pales in comparison to what God did on the vertical, right? There's nothing that can compare to what Christ did for us. So that's kind of my frame of reference and the passion by which I just want the world to hear how God is a redeemer and he's willing to reach down from heaven and give us what we don't deserve. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's like what set me off on this journey to jail. My goodness. Uh, goosebumps, right? I'm hearing that from you for the first time. And you share it, obviously, probably shared it hundreds of thousands of times with other people. But I can still sense how powerful that moment was for you. Um, As you you then put on a jumpsuit, as you say, and you go to prison, you're on fire for God, which is kind of unique, you know, because most people when they're walking to prison are probably at their lowest moment. And you feel like maybe you're at your highest moment spiritually, but then you actually have to go to prison. I have to imagine prison isn't glamorous, but can you kind of take us through what that experience was like and maybe what the Lord showed you 
during that time that you spent, I believe it was four plus years, right? Yeah, four years and seven months. It was truly a time where when people say, how long did you spend? I say 55 months. That felt like 55 days because of the peace of God. And that had to be renewed day by day. So I am on a spiritual high. I leave the courtroom in shackles and chains. The very next place they took me was the transitional place in Trenton. It's like Dracula's castle. It's dark. It's it's dingy. Yet there was this joy and this peace inside of me that even guards started to see and even other inmates started to see. And I was just excited to see what the Lord was going to do next. I truly was relieved to be in isolation. That way I can get to know my God all over again. So what I learned was 6 a.m., the lights would shine on and I was transferred to a dormitory setting. So there's 37 other inmates beside myself, 38 in total, no dividing walls. It's complete chaos and selfishness and violence. It's it's hell on earth, really it is. You put people together, different backgrounds, different crimes. Everybody's at a different place. A lot of people are bitter there. So it's a place where you essentially, you go where you fit in. Birds of a feather flock together. And at 6 a.m., these lights would shine on and all hell would break loose, right? Because people are rolling out of bed. They're going to the mess hall to, to have their first meal of the day. It, it's just like the walking dead. That's what That's what it looks like. And I remember thinking, if I wait until 6 a.m. to wake up, then I'm going to be devoured by this place. Every day, I'm going to be devoured. So I decided to, as I say, wake up earlier than hell. Mm -hmm. So I woke up at 5 a.m. I woke up an hour before the lights would kick on. I'd roll out of bed, get on my knees, and just give God the day. God, today is yours. Lead me where you need me. I'd get to a solo table. I'd open the Bible, and I would just begin to read it. So by the time 6 a.m. came, and my peers are waking up, and I say to people all the time, like, you can't wipe darkness out of your eyes when it's in your heart. So these guys are just like, they're in misery and I'm already, you know, hypersensitive to the peace of God. And I decided to just start saying good morning to people as they walk by the table. That was it. Two words. I wanted to let everybody know this was a good morning. I'd say good morning. And then you might be listening to this from your cell phone in a comfortable room somewhere. But let me tell you, those two words, good morning in a place like prison are deadly words. Like nobody wants to hear that there's anything good about morning. So a lot of inmates would tell me that like, man, shut the bleep up. There's nothing good about prison. But every day I was committed to say good morning. And I'll tell you what happened over time. People began to say it back to me. Just two words. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Over time, people that were fighting it began to crave it. In fact, one gentleman who would push back every day and curse at me, I felt him hovering over my shoulder one day and I turn around and it's him. And he's like, kind of give me the eye. And I go, good morning. He goes, yeah, good morning, Matt. Come to find out he gets moved off the housing unit sometime later. He found me in the prison yard one day and goes, I cannot explain to you how those two words when I was in your housing unit set up my entire day. And Jason, what I learned was, you know, being the light of the Lord, you don't have to be on a platform preaching a message. You just have to have the light of Christ come out of you, even by being um, good manner, like good morning. It's very rare to go into a grocery store these days and like tell the, the clerk, hey, God bless you. How can I pray for you? Nobody does that because it's uncomfortable and we're, we're moving at it such a fast pace. But those two words in jail, good morning, began to change the culture. It went from being a selfish environment to a selfless environment. Began a Bible study, invited people. Two people came. Four people eventually came. Four turned to eight. Eight turned to 16. 16 eventually turned to 32. And my first wow. 18 months in prison, um, people don't know this part about my story. I don't talk about it too much. I was with former NBA All-Star Jason Williams, and I'm sure you know who he is. Sure. Former NBA All-Star Jason Williams, New Jersey Net, had his incident where he killed his limo driver. Him and I end up in the same institution, on the same housing unit, at the same table, leading a Bible study. In fact, I was recently just with Jason in Florida. Um, he's had his bumps, and he's had his highs and lows, but he's doing phenomenal, and he is giving back as best as he can with the platform the Lord has given him. So, you know, throw that into the mix. Jason Williams and I, six foot 11 NBA all-star and a pro soccer player are on a housing unit teaching a Bible study and watching the Lord begin to shape hearts. You know, atheists coming to know the Lord, Muslims coming to know Christ as God, um, people of all types of backgrounds coming to this Bible study. And the warden, this is the final thing I'll say, the warden so much so appreciated what we were doing there. He came up to us one day and said, I just want to commend what you guys are doing here. Listen, I've never seen anything like it. And what he was basically saying was like, you guys are changing this place. And and that's the greatest compliment for a Christian to see how God is willing to use us wherever we're at. August 3rd, 
2014. That's where it was, right? That it takes you to the date. There's a lot of date specific dates yeah. here, but for you, those dates have more meaning than maybe just, you know, a date like today when we're recording this. But for you, August 3rd, 2014, that's the day that you get out of jail and Correct. you go back into society. At that point, were you ready in the sense of, okay, I know God where you're calling me to, and I know what you want me to do, or are you just kind of like, all right, let's see what, what, what the Lord has in plan here. Did you ha kind of have a, an idea of where God might be taking you to because you're a pastor now, spoiler alert. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I'm yeah. thinking, okay, this is the last place most people on 20 in 2014 coming out of jail would have probably thought Matthew Mayer would end up with being a pastor. So kind of take us through leaving, uh, you know, jail, getting out. And then that purpose that we're all looking for from the Lord. Yeah. You know, it was in jail where I discovered the gift, right? The gift for Matthew Mayer wasn't playing a sport. Yeah, that was a talent. I misused it. I abused it. Didn't give God glory in it. But the gift that God gave me was to communicate, to teach, to teach his word, to explain his truth. So when I discovered that gift in jail, that Bible study, which we ran every day for an hour for those four years, I was teaching the Bible every day. So when I look back, people ask me this question, Jason, today, uh, did you go to seminary? And I go, I'm going to go to seminary. I went to a cemetery. <laughs> and I, I say that because prison is the place of death. And that's where I learned about life. So, you know, seminary is great and all some pastors go through seminary, but seminary without Jesus is a cemetery and a cemetery with Jesus becomes a seminary. So wow. I discovered the gift. God gave me the time to develop the gift. And then by the time August 3rd came around, I was just excited to deploy, deploy the gift. I didn't know what that looked like. I knew that I would speak I knew that um, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. I knew that I was going to point to Christ in everything I said and did. And as soon as I got out, speaking opportunities came by churches, by schools, by colleges, by, you know, locker talks, wherever the door opened. My wife and I um, we got married. That's a whole, that'd be a whole nother segment, how my <laughs> wife and I came and how the Lord blessed that. But we were on the road, we were traveling all over the place and I was just sharing my testimony and teaching God's word. And it wasn't long before a pastor in Ocean City heard about the, the fact that I spoke at his son's high school and basically reached out to me and said, hey, I want to take you in and I wanna um, groom you and basically invested in me. And that was in 2015. So I became part of the church that I'm at now. They ordained me a couple years later to be the teaching pastor. And that's the role I'm currently in. So I still independently travel and speak a lot, Lord willing, when any, whenever those doors open. But I predominantly spend most of my time in the church, just sharing my heart for redemption and teaching God's word. So, uh, so many details, Jason. It, it truly just excites me when I get to talk about how God can restore years that the locusts have eaten, right? The prophet said, the Lord restores the years the locusts have eaten. So, there's no such thing as dead time, gone time, downtime in God's economy. It's he's a faithful God and he's he's willing and able to restore when we give him access to these circumstances, right? So look at my life, my past is tarnished. It is saturated in shame for what I did, but not in God's economy. God says I want to make that shame useful so people can see my grace. Mm. I love all that you're saying. This has been a really powerful conversation. I hope everybody listening is encouraged and as encouraged as much as I am, Matt. Um, as we wind down, I want you to share a little bit about just Truth Over Trend. I know that's the website that people can learn more about you, truthovertrend.com. But why those words, the idea of Truth Over Trend? Share a little bit about that. All right. So long story short, it is truthovertrend.com. And I'll tell you, when I first went away after speaking in so many schools and I was writing daily from jail and I would send home by snail mail, we didn't have internet. I didn't see any of this, but I would write with a pen on a piece of paper, my thoughts, like a journal. And my mom began to post them online and they began to get shared and comments. So they decided to form a website. And the website was originally the mattmayerstory.com. The victim's mm -hmm. family actually was contributing to that website. They were writing their thoughts. So they had a blog. I had a blog. It went viral. You know, within the first couple months, it had like 30,000 hits and then 100,000 hits. It began to go around the world. So here I am in jail writing for a website that I've never seen. And I'm writing my thoughts out. And this is kind of the, the momentum that the Lord allowed for me to have. But it never sat well in my stomach about the name of the website, the Because I didn't want it to be about me. Being about me got me there. 
So as soon as I got out and I got to see what was going on on the website and who was managing it and my family had contributed to it, it was so amazing to see. But I wanted to move away from my name on a ministry or on a website. And what I found, especially speaking with kids, is they're so attracted to trends. Each week there's a new trend or a new dance that they learned on YouTube or a new saying. Like, you know, when I first got out, the, the, the main word was like fleek. And I'm like, what mm -hmm. is fleek? And the next week it was, a, it was, you know, that trend was over. So I said, there's something that doesn't change. It's timeless and it changes people's hearts when it arrives on time and it's truth. And that became like the mantra, truth over trend. The truth of Christ in me should speak louder than the trends of the culture around me. And that is where we landed. So a group of people come together and go, Matt, if that's the thing you're often sharing, then let's go with that website. And I was like, I don't want it to point to me. I just want it to point to truth, truth over trends. So that became like the hub where you would find videos, uh, messages that I teach at church or other churches are on there, podcasts that I did with my mom when I first got out called uh, Matt and Mom. There's resources on there, books that I've written that I had the opportunity to, to write on paper. Uh, I write a daily dose every day. It's a very short, spiritual um, daily dose for people to consider. I write longer blogs. So it's just, it's where I send people if they want any other information or if they want to book me to speak, it's truthovertrend.com. So that really is the background behind the platform. I call it a platform because God has allowed me the opportunity to stand on it. Yeah. Truthovertrend.com is the website. Again, you can learn more about Matthew Maher. All right. This has been a powerful conversation. The last question that I'm going to ask you is a question I ask all of our guests, most of our guests, I should say, here on Sports Spectrum. And with 2020 and the craziness that this year has brought, I'm wondering what the great lesson the Lord has shown you and he's teaching you during this particular point in our, in our time, in your time. What's he showing you? What's he teaching you right now? Yeah, you know what? I think because there's so many narratives out there and it's so easy to get led astray by narratives, right? Which we call opinion or political correctness. And I think my passion in 2020 has been the Christian is called to biblical correctness, right? So knowing the narrative of God, which is truth, it's timeless. And it is the only power that can change a human soul. And that is exactly what's needed when you look around in our world today and cities are burning and I'm going, that is probably because pulpits aren't on fire. Mm -hmm. Cities are on fire because pulpits in the church aren't on fire. So my responsibility is to provide spiritual context to the world by looking at the word, God's word, timeless and true. So the, the lesson for any Christian out there is we're Christians. Right. I'm not a white Christian, Jason. I'm a Christian who happens to be white. And I think my my identity in Christ is what informs my perspective. It informs my decisions. And I think we got it backwards, especially in the church. People are, you know, they're joining narratives and they're forgetting who they are in Christ. And it's very easy when you lead with any other adjective before the noun, the noun being Christian an adjective being, you know, I'm an evangelical Christian or I'm a white Christian or I'm a black Christian. You just modified the Christian of you. And that always leads to division. So the Christians need to come back to their identity being in Christ and let his identity and his integrity be what infuses our justice and our mercy and our humility. He is Matt Mayer. He is a pastor, former pro soccer player, and uh, a great encouragement to me. I hope you guys really enjoyed his story. Matt, thanks for joining us here on the show today. Really appreciate your time and we'll get you back and we'll talk some more about a few other topics, including you and your wife, which you said is a whole another story. So we'll have to get you back to share that story as well. But uh, thanks for joining us. People can go check out truthovertrend.com and learn more and uh, just appreciate you, Matt. Thanks, buddy. Jason, thank you so much. God bless you and yours. Keep up the good work. Whew, what a story, Matthew Mayer. What a powerful, powerful testimony. Many thanks to Matthew for joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. Learn more by, again, going to the website, truthovertrend.com, truthovertrend.com, and you'll learn more about him. You can hear more of his story. You can even book him to come and speak and share his testimony with your audience. I told him after we were finished recording, I said, I hope you and I get to partner together and go speak at, you know, different, whatever it is, church conferences or, you know, venues, maybe it's schools, but just being able to share a powerful testimony like Matthew has, I can't imagine the amount of people that will be moved by that. And the point that Matthew makes in terms of 
sending people to Jesus and deflecting all the credit to himself is inspiring to me. Also want to update you as Matthew and I closed and, and once we hit stop on the record button, I realized I didn't ask him about the current relationship that he has with the Cap family. Of course, 55-year-old with Hort Cap was killed by Matthew in the drunk driving accident. And don't you know that the Cap family and the Mayer family, including Matthew, have an incredible relationship, many of them walking with Jesus and starting a relationship with the Lord and really great things happening uh, in the midst of one of the most tragic things that could happen. So I wanted to update you guys on that as well, that Matt and uh, and his family have a great relationship with the Cap family. Uh, and that is the power of the gospel. That is redemption. That is forgiveness. That is reconciliation. That is the gospel. And I'm just grateful that Matt would share his story with us here today on the show. We're also thankful to you for listening and to our sponsors, Water Mission. You can check them out at watermission.org to fight the global water crisis. And of course, Compassion International, releasing children from poverty. Check them out at compassion.com slash team up right now. Lastly, we want to send you to our website, sportspectrum.com, where you can bookmark that website Check it out every single day. We have daily devotionals. We have articles that intersect sports and faith written each day. And then, of course, every single podcast can be found at sportspectrum.com. And if you listen to this podcast on, like, let's say, Apple apps or Spotify, you can do us a favor there and click subscribe so that you never miss an episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast. We're releasing at least three a week, sometimes more. And it's a great way to stay connected to the Lord by hearing stories like Matt Mayer's on the intersection of sports and faith. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode, and we'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Hope you all have a great rest of your day.